the Gun, episode 117 here. It is time to preview our final Big 12 Conference clash with the Oklahoma Sooners. Well, Jed, I guess if I'm going to be completely accurate, right, there's probably some very minuscule world uh, chance somewhere in the world in an alternate universe where both these teams could probably still technically meet in the Big 12 championship game somehow if crazy things would happen, and there's probably a point zero 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 three chance of that happening. But... For all intents and purposes, the last time that the Mountaineers and the Sooners will clash as Big 12 Conference foes coming up this Saturday night, 7 o'clock in Norman. We've got plenty to get to here on this Sooners preview. I'm Wesley Euler alongside the signal caller, Jed Drenning. We are efforting our buddy Owen Schmidt, but Jed, I don't know. It's weird because we heard from him not too long ago, but he never, Owen never confirmed that he was going to be on time tonight. And we know how these things work. You, our loyal listeners, will remember uh, last year when we couldn't get a hold of Owen and we were really worried. And then it turned out that his phone was at the bottom of a lake because uh, he dropped it while he was fishing. Uh, who knows where the beer truck is, but he's out there somewhere trucking along of that, I'm sure. Yeah, there's a Michigan analyst who's looking for something to do these days. Maybe we should send him with his uh, camera to follow the beer truck around because something tells me he might come back with some video of the beer truck looking down at his phone when it rings and it's us and him ignoring it. So, uh oh, uh oh, that could be our Zapruder film. Uh oh. Well, could yes. Be. Uh, it's funny that Jed mentions Michigan there because for our headlines today, I, I want to go there first, really, very quickly. A, uh, a thank you to Bet Online for presenting this episode of ITG. We all know Bet Online is where the game starts. Uh, Jed, headline Michigan, you know, they are currently, what, in a bit of a purgatory, in a bit of a holding pattern as they await to see uh, if there's going to be, if any, going to be type of punishment for this, this sign stealing scandal. And so, you know, there's been some back and forth. The Big Ten put out a statement a couple weeks ago and kind of announced, you know, doing some investigations and things like that. And they'll they'll have announcements and in, in, in things like that at further dates. Well, Michigan today, Wednesday, as you and I record this, I should say yesterday for when this drops on Wednesday, November 8th, uh, Michigan sent a response letter to the Big Ten conference. And in that Michigan claimed that any action from the league would be a breach of the Big Ten handbook and that any discipline against Jim Harbaugh would exceed the commissioner's authority under the sportsmanship policy. And then finally, they also kind of sent this warning, and not kind of, they did send this warning in their letter, Jed, saying, and I quote, the conference should act cautiously when setting precedent, given the reality that in-person scouting, collusion among opponents, and other questionable practices may well be far more prevalent than believed, end quote. Oh, Jed, there's a lot to chew on there, but it sure sounds to me like Michigan is playing, and you can tell me if you think I'm wrong, but it sounds like Michigan is playing the card of, hey, we ain't the only ones doing this, and if you really want to go there, there's a house of cards that could come tumbling down. They're playing the, hey, you're making an example out of us. Don't make an example out of us when everybody's doing this. Yeah, it certainly sounds like that, and the truth is this is one more I would start with this self-inflicted distraction uh, as they are poised to head up to happy head over to happy Valley and take on Penn state to one of their two biggest games of the year and a season full of self-inflicted distractions at Michigan. Uh, you know, I've had conversations with people recently and, and I've told them, look, I, I do believe this is starting to feel like Jim Harbaugh's Woody Hayes moment. You know, when he punched the kid in the bowl game, I mean, that's that's unfortunately forget everything he accomplished. That's uh, that's what he's now remembered for first and foremost when his name's mentioned. And they say, well, without the evidence, are people really years moving forward going to going to regard him as the guy who did that or believe Michigan did that? I said, look, all the evidence they're going to need to point to 30 years from now when fans talk about what Jim Harbaugh did and didn't do in Michigan is they're going to say, look. Before these allegations, they weren't very good. After these allegations, they were almost unbeatable. As fans will see it in the court of public opinion, that's game, set, match. Unfortunately, that's how people regard it. Now, I'm going to try and see it both ways. And I'll, I, look, I'm just a detached, neutral observer. I have no dog in the hunt here. But first of all, when people are showing the clip of the Michigan sideline in the Ohio State game, 
and he's standing next to the Michigan defensive coordinator and they're, he's telling them what the signals are. And the next thing you know, they run the play and they got the play and they stopped the play. Uh, people are acting as though that's exhibit A. See, we told you that's exactly what they did to cheat. No, that doesn't show me anything. That just shows me what I see on every sideline in America. You know, an analyst who understands and studies the signals, which every analyst in America does, telling his staff, hey, here are the signals we got. It doesn't show how they got them. The issue is, did they go way beyond the pale, which it's more and more starting to appear as though they did, and not do this on game day, sideline to sideline, or not do this with some TV copy that's available for public consumption, but actually send an agent, send an actor, I should say, to sit behind someone's bench and tape them. That is the part we're talking about. What happened in that clip that they're showing in the Ohio State-Michigan game doesn't prove that that came, that knowledge came from filming behind the sideline. But more and more things are starting to suggest that, hey, this did happen. I mentioned to you before, Wes, usually we say the cover-up's worse than the crime. Well, the mm -hmm. craziest thing about this, especially for a kid educated at the Naval Academy, there was no cover-up. Everything was way out in the open. The money transfer, the ticket purchases, everything. I mean, there is a clear-cut paper trail for just about all of this, as I understand it. But there will be a ruling. Something will happen. And, and all I can see at this point moving forward or a month ago moving forward, whenever this really started to gain purchase, it's now fair game to call into question anything Michigan has accomplished during this run because you really don't know. Is that because they had a better plan and better players? Or is that because they had an added advantage competitively that other teams don't have? It's fair to question that under every circumstance now because Michigan has made it so by the nature of what they apparently have done. I'm not going to rule on it and say they did it until it's determined. But I don't know if you're going to have the smoking gun beyond the videos that they're already talking about they have. But if you're looking for proof and how people will regard this, I don't care how the Big Ten rules, how the NCAA rules. It really doesn't matter one way or the other. People, I think, have already decided. Michigan wasn't very good before this happened, and they've been really good since it happened. That's all people need to see. So 30 years from now, I'm quite confident people will reflect on this as Michigan cheating and it being a scandal because of it. It's funny. I completely agree with everything you're saying. Uh, it is funny how we perceive these things, though, isn't it? Because I think you're right. I think I think 20, 30 years ago when you asked people about Jim Harbaugh's time at Michigan, this is what they're they're going to bring to the forefront. I think um, 20, 30 years from now when you talk to people about this era of baseball and how good the Houston Astros were, they're going to bring the cheating scandal to the forefront. But I don't think 20, 30 years from now, Jed, when people bring up Tom Brady and Bill Belichick, the first thing they're going to say is spy gate or deflate gate or whatever gate. There's, there's a weird balance of if you're just good enough to win a little bit and then you get caught cheating and that's perceived as the thing that puts you over the top, you get condemned for it forever. But if Michigan had two or three national championship appearances and a couple rings under Jim Harbaugh, I don't know if they would be getting it, the narrative might turn have turned into oh, all those people are just jealous. You know what I mean? Oh, everybody's doing it. All those people are just jealous. Kind of like it's become with the Patriots and Tom Brady and Bill Belichick. Well, I think the biggest difference was with the Patriots. And this doesn't exist yet with Michigan. Maybe it will. We won't know till moving forward. The comparisons with the Patriots were look at their record before that happened and look at their record after. Their record after was far more exceptional than before. Right, right. I think that's why people dismiss that. If that's why they were doing it, then what were they doing to win at a higher rate than before they did it? So when the two sides argue about what the Patriots did or didn't do, that's the discussion. With Michigan, we don't know what they will do. Moving forward, we don't know how this will land. Now, if Michigan, now without this advantage that apparently existed for the last couple of seasons that, that contributed to them being so dominant, let's say that they can no longer do it. I mean, there's every pair of eyes in the world on Michigan, on Ann Arbor, every move that they make right, right now. So right. assuming they can no longer do this. Well, if Jim Harbaugh stays, and let's say they go on a run and don't lose for three years. Yes, now this is not his legacy. Sure, if they sure. have a better record after it happened, like the Patriots, than before, then I agree with you. 
much like the Patriots, that won't be the first thing they talk about. It'll be one thing they talk about. Yeah, yeah. But we don't know that yet. We don't know what's going to happen. More people are saying, hey, this is going to come down and come down hard. Harbaugh's not going to deal with it. He was already suspended for something he sees as nonsensical to begin with to start the season. He's going to jet off to the NFL and be gone. But if that doesn't happen, and if there's a B plot, or excuse me, uh, an alternative story that plays out here, and Michigan goes on this unprecedented Nick Saban-like run at Alabama, then people won't say, well, that's the only reason Michigan won, because very obviously it wasn't. But we haven't seen that yet. So... It's certainly going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. I mean, heck, by this time that this drops on Thursday morning, there could be an announcement of something from the Big Ten or something from the NCAA. Uh, this is very much still a watch this space moment, Jed, because this story isn't going anywhere. In fact, Absolutely. you know, next in fact, next time we get on here to record, we might be following up on this because you know, keep an eye on your timelines. There could be there could be some type of news coming here soon. Uh, but yes, I am what Wes. And it's interesting you brought up the Patriots. The more this plays out, you know, I'm pivoting as we go to break. One of the things people will talk about with Belichick now is Belichick without Brady. No, oh, 100%. That will be one of the first that's, things. Now, that's, I always thought there's was, just so uh, many more narratives around that conversation than the yes, cheating one. I always one thought now. that was stacking the deck. In other words, well, if this if this coach didn't have this quarterback, his record would be – name a coach that the, – the exceptions to that are very rare. I mean, Bill Walsh without Joe Montana? I mean, he didn't do a whole lot with Steve Young. I mean, you know, uh, you, you can name the coach, and typically – I mean, whether it's Roger Staubach, Tom Landry, Chuck Noll, Terry Bradge, I mean, it's it's unfair to do that to any coach because yeah. most of their success came. But, uh, you know, it, it, it is going to be mentioned now because I think people are looking for some reason to complain about Belichick. And but anyway, that's a whole different conversation. Oh, but, you know, absolutely. with Brady having the success with the Bucks that he did winning a Super Bowl without Belichick. I do think they're going to bring that up. Hey, quarterback play, breaking news, quarterback play, particularly in high-level football, really matters. <laughs> kind of does, I mean, yeah. Look at, look at how the narrative on Dabo Sweeney has shifted a little bit when he hasn't had Trevor Lawrence or Deshaun Watson under center. It's, uh, yeah. it's amazing. It's amazing how those, those things work. Um, look, at, look at where LSU went very quickly with Joe Burrow and where they've been ever since. Uh, it's, it, yeah. is, it is amazing how those things can work. Okay. Before we go to break, let's try this out. Well, okay, we got we got Owen in the waiting room. Owen's here. Okay. So here's the question is do we bring him in now and laugh real quick and then go to break? Or if we because if we do hey, that, man. we might we might we might risk him dropping a, a, a curse word or something. All right, let's bring him in. This will be funny. Here we go. That's always a risk. It's all that's right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just occupational hazard here, part of the that's part right. of the territory. All right, let's see. Hold on. Let's see if we can get him in here. Oh, big O. There he is. Up, oh, it's popping in. Dude. Dude, we're recording. We're live. What's up, brother? Where are you at? I'm uh driving from work. Oh, you're in the car driving? Yep. Oh, we don't wanna we don't wanna endanger you here. Oh, us back. <laughs> yeah, I thought he was with the nitty gritty there, dirt band there. There's no <laughs> into the door. There's no, yeah. Well, I could turn the light on, but uh... no. If no, we, we don't want courtesy. Yeah, if we're dri if we're drive if you're driving right now, we want you to be safe. How far are you from home? Yeah, buddy, it's it's gonna be twenty five minutes. Oh, jeez. Well, you want to hop we'll in? Take, why don't we'll you take a long commercial break? Why don't, why, don't you, why don't you just hop? Yeah, we'll we'll listen. We'll take a little break here, and we'll and we'll you know, Jed and I will come back in, and we can get things started. And you want to hop back on when you get home? I don't want you. I don't want you risking life and limb out there. Find a nice. Well, I'm just talking huddle. here. It's not like uh, I'm. There is no video for me. So, <laughs> oh, and I'll tell you this. I mean, this is the most handsome you've ever looked, right here. I mean, you look great, bro. <laughs> Actually, I have. I have the perfect picture to send to Skylar to superimpose over Owen's box right here. I have a, the perfect picture. Just put the why, Professor why Schmidt. Why don't we do that? I'll just, I'll just talk, and uh, we'll do our thing. All right. Okay. Sounds You're good. You're not going to like the picture. <laughs> let's go to let's go to break here. We'll regroup with Cartoon Owen or or whatever Owen Jed has in store on the other side. When I'm going to text uh, it to West. Let me find it. 
Uh oh, this is this is gonna be good. This will be fun. Listen, this is fitting. All right, it's the last time we're gonna play the Sooners. We'll get a little off the rails here. We come back and talk a little Oklahoma on the other side. You are in the gun. Nobody supports the Blue and Gold Mountaineers like Toothman Ford. With over 20 NIL deals and counting, Toothman Ford continues to rally behind our student athletes. And it's time we rally and support the dealer that supports the Mountaineers. Not only does Toothman Ford offer the best prices in the state on pre-owned, their never over MSRP campaign on new Fords guaranteed to save you thousands. Drive with pride all season long, knowing you're supporting the dealer that fuels our Mountaineers. Toothman Ford, we're car cost less in Grafton and at toothman4.com. For more West Virginia Mountaineer football content, be sure to follow us on Twitter at In The Gun Podcast. For nearly 20 years, Fortis has been the nation's leader in providing guaranteed roof performance programs for commercial buildings. Fortis offers roof performance solutions that feature extensive initial and ongoing reconditioning for commercial buildings as an alternative to traditional replacement with long-term performance guarantees that are backed by global leader Lloyds of London. Fortis offers a comprehensive range of roof performance management programs that provide financial security, extend the life of our customers' roofs, and make a significant impact on ROI. Fortis is currently improving performance and increasing ROI for customers at more than 4,800 locations with more than 140 million square feet protected, including many Fortune 500 companies that have turned to Fortis to save money, gain financial certainty, and extend the life of their existing roofs. Fortis has helped customers save more than $520 million in capital roof replacement costs for an average ROI of over 250%. To learn more, visit fortis.us.com. Fortis, roof performance and financial certainty guaranteed. Let's go, Mountaineer fans. You're tuned in to In the Gun with Wes, the runaway beer truck, and the signal caller. Back in the gun here. We are uh, doing a little tap dancing. Big O has, uh, should be momentarily back at the Casa de Schmidt and, uh, and into his podcast dungeon studio to, uh, to, to join us just momentarily. Um, as he is uh, on his way back from some from some school, some coaching responsibilities. This episode of ITG brought to you also in part by our friends at Toothman. Big thanks to JR. We all know cars cost less in Grafton. Make sure you're supporting Toothman, who supports us, who supports our WVU student athletes, and uh, give back to or support those who are giving back to to our student athletes. Um, all right, Jed. Well, it's the Sooners, it's the Mountaineers, 7 o'clock Saturday night, down on the prairie, right, as they say down there in, in Norman, the palace on the prairie. I knew I was going to butcher that. That's why I just started there like 37 times. The palace on the prairie. I was in my own head. I was like, don't butcher it. You got it. And then I psyched myself out there for a second. Palace on the prairie. Sure. It's been a – um. I mean, I'm not going to lie, Jed. It hasn't been a fun – decade ish with the Sooners. Uh, they have had our number for the most part. Now we got them last year. Let's get them this yeah. year and go out on a two game winning streak. Um, although I will say, you know what too, like we've given them games in Norman a few times. Uh, certainly when we were just most recently there two years ago, a um, couple other times as well too, where there were games that, that came down the wire. Now there has been times that we've gone out there and the Sooners have, have given us the business and, and, and kind of made quick work of us. Uh, but this will be the last time, friend, at least, uh, you know, in the confines of the Big 12 Conference, because you never know what could happen in bowl games and playoffs or things like that in the future. But last time we're going to see the Sooners here uh, from a Big 12 Conference perspective, at least, you know, for, for the foreseeable future, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in today's college football, never say never. Who knows? You know, twelve team expanded playoff. Who knows what ends up happening? Bowl alliances change, but yeah, it's it's going to be strange. This is our sixth trip to the Palace on the Prairie, and I'm I'm impressed in different ways each time. We've got to see that facility change and undergo some renovations. I talked in the last episode how even the way in which we enter the field from the visitors' locker room. Uh, is much different than it was in 2013 or even 2015. But it's strange when you when you get to a point where you you know a road venue really well. Okay, it's and and that's kind of where we're at with Texas and Oklahoma. And it's weird to think that that's going to be no more. Uh, there's like each game, uh, each game 
that we've been out there, there's something I remember about the trip, you know, it's or the game itself. 2013, what, what I remember is we took Haas and Coach Nealon out because it was our first trip back to Norman since the big signature win in 1982. And I sat between them on the team charter. So I was like, you talk about, you know, winning a contest here. I was like, holy cow, I'm sitting between Haas and Coach Nealon on the charter to Oklahoma. I'm flying into history here. And then in 2015, I talked the other night about, you know, at halftime, what was going on and those fans and the, around the locker room. That was kind of fun. Uh, they just get energized back when we were in that cage. That was the game where uh, outside of uh, Carl Joseph himself, I might have been the closest person in the stadium to D.D. Westbrook when Carl almost decapitated him, right? Well, almost denogonized him. I mean, I when you go watch those clips, I'm standing right there. I thought blood was going to splatter on my shirt. Uh, but I think of that. I remember how impressed I was by Baker in that game, making those big plays in the second half downfield, and those playmakers that they have. 2017, I remember how – deflating that was because that was just you know a handful of days a, a week uh, actually it was eight days after the uh the texas game in which will had broke his finger so a season with so much promise just went down spiraling down so quickly and uh and chugs had to get the start i remember you know dana and the crew offensively tried to go some wildcat with kennedy mccoy to choose some clock you know early in the game it was a second or third play that was the week after Baker uh, didn't get to start because of what happened at the Kansas game and Lawrence when he grabbed, you know. Uh, well, Ky Kyler Murray gets to start. Kyler Murray goes what? Yards up, I was going to say 70 68 yards, yards up yeah. our sidelines. Yeah, to the to the three. Uh, but yeah, I remember that game. And then in 2019, you just kind of knew going in that look, this is a fundamental mismatch, but the very definition of a mismatch. They, they had Jalen hurts. They were cooking with gas. We were in rebuild mode. Uh, a couple of things I remember about that are some quirky special teams plays. They blocked the punt and we faked the punt to Dante Bonamico. I just saw shout out to Dante. I just saw, saw Dante at almost seven desserts in Bridgeport last week. Uh, and we got to catch up, but, uh, and even in that game, I remember Austin Kendall, of course, that was big for him going back to see his old teammates, Lincoln Riley and Austin Kendall having some moments in the, on the field in the pregame. And then in 2001, as you start to work toward where we were get, making these things more competitive, of course, we'll talk about this again. We talk about the preview when Owen gets on, but we were a tie game, apparently driving for a potential game winning score it was a second and 12 situation from around the 35 uh strange that we're talking about this now because we had this some of it play out against byu uh with movement and you know cadence simulations on the defensive side well oklahoma had some pre-snap stuff going on defensively there you know we were playing two different quarterbacks with garrett and with jarrett and uh, all those things contributed to that snap by by zach and next thing you know, we're punting. We pin them inside the 10. You thought we were still in good position for the defense that showed up all night. Spencer Rattler drives it in the length of the field. And I still find this implausible and unbelievable. But they kicked the first walk-off game-winning field goal in Oklahoma Sooners history to win that game. Uh, we were, of course, heavy underdogs in that one. And it almost feels like this time around, uh, I'm glad that we're a 13 point dog in a moving line. Uh, I really hope it goes to 14. I did a podcast this week with a couple of former Oklahoma, former Oklahoma players and, and, uh, Gabe Eichert and Teddy Lehman, they do a great job on their podcast. And, and I, those guys were really concerned because they know the jet fuel motivation for West Virginia has been the 14 all season. <laughs> they said, please football gods do not let that line get bumped to 14 and make it that perfect for Neil. Well, Brown's you know, I, te please. I texted you, I texted you that too in the group when you texted us a few days ago and you said, Oh, the lines in we're 13 point or 13 and a half go. point favorites. You and did. I said to you, you I texted right back right away. I said, make it 14. Come on. <laughs> you did make it 14 because, you know, I do remember uh, going to TCU. Neil said that to the team. We were 14 point underdogs at TCU. Yep. yep. Yeah. You shared if that you story remember. on the podcast. Here. Uh, yep. Yeah. He, he said, hey, we were picked 14th in the preseason by the media. Well, guess what they think of you after one in three straight games. You're 14 point underdogs tonight. 
So this that night was all about fourteen, but but uh, yeah, it, we'd really have it no other way than to me. This is the ideal circumstance if there's such a thing as a send off, one last shot to get these guys on the prairie as a Big Twelve member. You want to be a heavy underdog. You don't want to catch them sagging. Uh, I mean, they've lost two straight. They're ticked off. I don't see that as sagging. I see that as pissed. Yeah. I mean, both those games were on the road. Now they're back in the prayer. I was really hoping, as as I said earlier, this will be a, a lazy early kickoff to mitigate that crowd impact. As if you're ever going to mitigate that crowd impact at Oklahoma. I mean, they that crowd brings it every time. We played them early. We played them mid afternoon. We played them under the lights, and it's always a madhouse. That crowd brings it and brings it strong, full throat for the balance of sixty minutes. Uh, so. I mean, why not be a 13-point underdog, take their best shot under the lights, have them ranked? This is what we want. We want to be the team to have an opportunity to knock them out of the top 25, to continue sending them into the spiral as they wind down their final season in the Big 12. And uh, I think the thing sets up well for a great opportunity for us, but you're going to have to play exceptional football. And all the things we do well, we're going to have to do well. And some of the things that we haven't done so well, we're going to have to do better and find ways to compensate yeah. for those things. But Yeah, and, and Jed, not only are they a team that, you know, that's the the balance I've tried to strike or I've been at least thinking about this week is, you know, is it good or bad that you're getting them off of two straight losses? Is it good because maybe they're thinking, oh, man, you know, last year things kind of spiraled on us and, and got out of hand, and now we've lost two games in a row. Is that happening again? Are we going to stumble down the stretch here and not have the finish we thought we were capable of? The other side of that is, right, you get a a team that is very talented, uh, that is now much more focused and pissed off and motivated and, and all those things. I think it's probably the latter. Hey, I hope it's the former. Maybe they're in their own heads a little bit, have a little doubt about, okay, are we really as good as we thought we were just a couple weeks ago? But, you know, Jed, this is also an Oklahoma team now. I mean, not only the two straight losses, right, but their two games before that as well, too, were down to the wire, dramatic yep. victories. I mean, the week before the, that loss to Kansas that started their little two-game win streak here, they – I, I can't even like put my hand out without the zoom doing the thumbs up thing here. Now it's like a bad like joke. Its own. I go like this exactly. and it's like, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah. I'm a, you think I'm Italian the way I'm using my hands. Um, you know, they, they had to, they had to stop the, the two point conversion uh, from UCF to potentially send that game into overtime. And then the week before they had the dramatic back and forth with Texas where Texas scores late, thinks they won it. And then Oklahoma drives down the field in just a few plays. To your and point Wes, to go a step dramatic further, victory. the Iowa state game. You might glance at it and say fifty to twenty. That, that's that wasn't true. A 50 it was close to game. Yeah, that yeah. was hard fought into the fourth quarter, and Iowa State just imploded. And and so again, that's another one of those things for me, right? It depends if I want to go optimistic, pessimistic, glass half full, glass half empty. I can look at it as glass half empty, and I can go, oh man, like this is a team that is you know played in a lot of close games and probably knows how to how to win them more often than not. I can look at it on the optimistic side and I can go, ah, they're really not that good. They've just gotten away with a couple so far and they've been fortunate to win some, some well, tight ones, but now year. they're, now they're, you know, fine in their level. They struggled, they with, struggled with everything. With they struggled year. with everything last year. They couldn't win close games, but they couldn't win close games. In other games words, particularly. this wasn't the Lincoln Riley Sooners. That culture left with him. And last year, what they struggled with, they were a baseball team with a horrible win and loss record in one run games. That's what they were. They lost a right. lot, just like West Virginia. We had the walk off kick by Casey. They had a lot of one possession losses last year. And they started to believe that they were turning that corner this year, winning some close games, winning the Texas game uh, in Red River, winning the uh, UCF game, finding ways to win those close games. Well, don't look now, but just as you talked about the last couple of close ones, they're right back to last year. And, and here's the thing about it, Wes. Their offense with Jeff Levy, those guys, those fans out there are groaning. I mean, it, it, it's hard to imagine when you look at, you know, they're number one in the Big 12 in total offense. They're averaging 490 yards a game. They're number one in scoring offense, 40 points a game. They're averaging 45 at home, by the way. But their fans are very discontented right now. And mm -hmm. one of the conversations that Teddy and Gabe were having they said, look, we've had people saying, hey, if it didn't go well early with this offense, we might even hear some boos. But they did boo Spencer Rattler back in 21. And I'm telling you, that created a weird vibe and dynamic. So anything to 
cut into that massive home field advantage they have, if that crowd feels like turning on the center's offense the first time they have to punt or whatever it might be, I'm all for it. Yep. Um, I'm with you on that one. I certainly am, Jed. Let's have a hot start. Maybe make that crowd a little cantankerous, that spoiled Sooners crowd. Maybe that'll be my pump-up speech at the end of this one. Big O, what's up, dog? You back in the fold, back in the podcast lounge. How are we doing? Golly, son. I've never made it from Beckley to my undisclosed podcast lair so quickly. Uh, mini, where's your mini me in your secret underground lair? You look like Austin Powers, <laughs> know, right? Faja, Faja, can you hear me, Father, Father? All right, he's hidden and uh, he's hidden under the Greenbrier. You know, Jeff Campbell told me, Soup Campbell, he told me that there's a clinic that I call on next to the Greenbrier. Uh, there's a primary care clinic. They have a cardiologist in there. It's a nice building. You've seen it as you head down toward the Greenbrier Row, and it's the big building up on the left before you drop down where the gate entrance to the Greenbrier is on the left, and it's connected to the Greenbrier. You go down an elevator, and you come out by the casino and all that. Well, as the story goes from Sue, because he's from down that way uh, in the southern part of the state, uh, back in the 50s when the bunker was being built in a clandestine way, the secret bunker, uh, the building that that, that uh, medical practice is in was the cover story to build that bunker. Hey, what are you guys doing here with all these construction crews? Oh, we're just building this, putting this building up. We're building this structure. Meanwhile, they were working on the bunker underneath. But thanks to, and shout out to Sue Campbell for that little West Virginia history story there. Not bad. That is a great story. Pretty neat. I like that. I and like who that. wouldn't want an underground bunker? I would, Absolutely. Ooh. Who wouldn't want an underground bunker and who wouldn't want a great roof? And if you want the best commercial roofing company in the business, a big shout out to Fortis for roof performance and financial certainty guaranteed. You got to visit Fortis.us.com. Shout out to our guy, Rick Lewis. All right, gentlemen, let's get into it here. We've been rambling. We've been gambling. It's time to talk a little Sooners. Jed, Where's this one begin? I mean, is it with the talented quarterbacks? Is it a coaching thing? Is it something you're seeing on defense, right? This is where we like to uh, – I like to throw up the alley-oop and let you slam dunk this one home wherever you think kind of the meat and potatoes of this matchup is, where it's going to be won or lost. What do you think that is this weekend against the Sooners? There's there's so many interesting storylines, but uh, I'm going to stick with the one that has to go well for us. Um and, and they've kind of paved the way this season. And that is uh, the West Virginia offense, more specifically the West Virginia offensive line, against this Sooners defense, what Brent Venables and crew have done on the defensive side of the football. And uh, w- when you look at West Virginia's offensive line, I mentioned this a couple times this week. We knew coming in, when you look at that starting five, you have hey, an NFL center quick, and Zach Real quick, yep. just so you guys know, I just didn't want you to be surprised. I got to pop up real quick. All right. You guys keep going. My daughter's crying right now. All right. I think this is just going to be, this is just, but this is going to be just a quick two minute thing. So you guys got this. Keep rolling. I'll be right back. Uh, He's a pretty confident dad, isn't he? (laughs) Just two minutes. So, Owen, we're looking at the five starters. You know what to expect out of Zach. You know, a lot of us are convinced he's the best center in college football. You know what to expect. And our big tackles, two NFL guys. We're convinced. Dwight's an NFL guy. Doug's an NFL guy. Tomas Remack, former freshman All-American. I think he is way too underrated as a piece of this offensive line. Incredibly athletic, strong, great technician. And Brandon Yates, at right guard, Brandon Yates is playing the best football of his West Virginia career. He played both guard positions and center against BYU. But the names that, that I keep going back to, uh, Nick Malone and Jaquay Hubbard. Those guys, Owen, have – they've been called on so often. West Virginia offensively is averaging 72 snaps per game. Those guys, if you combine their snaps, Jaquay and Nick, they're averaging 65 snaps a game. So those two have basically been thrust into duty as a full-time starter. What one, two combined, two players combining to be one full-time starter. That's how often we needed them to be the next man up with one or the other of these starting five being down. And I'd start with this. That's impressive. 
Oh man, I mean, you can see that. Obviously, those were were guys that uh, you know could be starters, right? Could be starters, and they've gotten the reps. They've gotten those those critical plays, and they've helped us uh, when we've needed them the most. And they're playing right now, playing some of the best football they've played as uh, per uh, Coach Neil Brown in his uh, in his presser. Um, you know, and it's so it's so evident, obviously, just because you've seen the last two games uh, against UCF and then um, last week against BYU, the run game has been absolutely unstoppable. Um, you know, so I'm looking forward to seeing what we're going to do down there. And I'm going to tell you what, we're 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 in a position right now, in my opinion, coming into this game. And I understand Oklahoma, the whole whatever coming off a loss deal. It is what it is. But I'm expecting a big run game uh, from from the Mountaineers this week, and those two boys right there are they're going to help out. When you stop and consider what Oklahoma has been tasked with the last couple of weeks, their defensive line has been anything short of dominant. They've been serviceable, uh, but Kansas moved the football on them. Obviously, Ollie Gordon and Oklahoma State moved the football on them. And how many times on this podcast have we discussed? The issues with West Virginia struggling with these young guys having run fits. Well, you've seen some of the same same things, Owen, out of the Oklahoma defense. When you're talking run fit issues, that's happened with them as well. So that's not confined to West Virginia. One of the things from a personnel standpoint, let's let's talk some of what Oklahoma brings to bear. And then we're going to get into West Virginia's run game and, and what Garrett's been doing in the throw game. Danny Stutzman's kind of their guy. Now, they've been moving him around, trying to find the best spot for him. Uh, he's a dude with some size, uh, 6'4", 236 pounds. He's really productive. He's one of the leading tacklers in the conference. Uh, they got uh, number seven is also a great backer. Uh, he's right behind Stutzman uh, with almost 50 tackles on the Sooners roster. Uh, the guy that's going to be interesting, and the more Oklahoma people you talk to that are kind of in the know and understand the program and understand the game, they look at this guy named Kobe McKenzie, and you'll see him wearing number 11. Uh, he's 6'2", 240. So he's he's roughly a, a, you know, a backer coming in CJ size, okay? Maybe a touch bigger. Uh, but what he is, he's, he's a very smart player. Uh, he's a great run stopper. Uh, he, he has good eyes, and he's a solid tackler. He's a very fundamentally sound tackler. He only has eight tackles on the year. But they think they forecast such a slugfest that they think they might insert this guy at Mike Backer and turn this into a game of nine on seven. Does that make sense? I mean, in other words, understanding what we do, we run way more than anybody else in this league. We dominate the clock. We keep our defense off the field so you can't get to those exposed second and third level players with lack of depth and all that. So they've kind of speculated that you might see more of Kobe McKenzie. So I would start with this. That's, that's one thing to keep an eye on. Remember he's number 11. So ask yourself if you, if you're paying attention to the game, how often do you see number 11 a and B how often do you see him in the box? So that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, when you work your way to the back end, uh, their playmakers, Billy Bowman, he's a little bit of everywhere. Uh, he'll stick his nose in it. He'll play downhill. He's physical. Uh, they have a lot of TFLs. It's it's in part because of guys like him, uh, but uh, he also will pick the football off. He's involved. He's one of those safeties, Owen, that's involved in a ton of action. Uh, he's always around the football. He's always playing downhill. He's he always has an aggressive posture, and and that's kind of what you're looking at. But if you look at who people have been throwing at, Woody Washington's targeted a lot. He's a talented kid, not the biggest kid in the world. But uh, people have had some success in attacking him at the one corner spot. Gentry Williams is the other corner. Now, Woody Williams is their go-to. He gets more defensive reps than anybody on that team. Uh, Bowman's been targeted. I mean, there will be times that people try and find selective ways to get after him. But I, I, I would, closing with their personnel, I'm going to go back to McKenzie, the run stopper. If he has a deficiency, it's in the pass game. So the question is going to be, can we sometimes go 11 or 12 personnel and get creative enough 
present one way, shift into something else, out leverage them. I mean, that's something that Jeff and Chad and that offensive crew do really well. All that, you know, presenting a different look than what you're going to you're going to land in uh, to get a leverage advantage. Can we find a way to get somebody isolated on Kobe McKenzie in space in the pass game? Can that be Cole Taylor? Uh, is there any way you can get a back isolated on him? Now, I know Oklahoma will desperately try to avoid that, but I think that's going to be one of the critical keys before we get into uh, us running the football or our pass game. That's kind of how I see Oklahoma in general because they are – incredibly disruptive they lead the big 12 in tackles for loss just like they did last year they were among the national leaders uh so they're aggressive in their run fits and sometimes when you are that aggressive you'll get out leveraged i mean that's kind of what we saw last year when we had some success with garrett in the run game they would get out leveraged by flying downhill in a run fit not secure the play and the next thing you know you got something cooking uh and then from a pass, uh, a pass rush standpoint, I would warn people, don't get too caught up in the fact that they're middle of the pack from a sack production standpoint. That's misleading. Uh, much like it was last year. It's, it's funny, guys. One of the first things I do as I'm going through the week to prepare for the broadcast on Saturday, I have an outline of my own kind of notes when I'm watching tape and different things I get from different places, the, the metrics I look at or anything else. And I keep them in, in this, this outline. So this year when I'm getting ready for Oklahoma, the first thing I do is look through the last couple of years outlines. Hey, is there anything that's not time sensitive that still matters guys? When, when I'm looking at their defense, the notes that I had on their defense last year, even some of the numbers, they're almost identical. It's kind of the same defense, except they're doing a better job of keeping a lid on things. So they're very aggressive. Don't sack you a lot, but they do impact the passer. They lead the Big 12 in, in interceptions with 15. They're among the national leaders with 15. That doesn't happen by not impacting the passer. Forget the lack of sacks. They hit the quarterback. They knock the quarterback down. They put those remember me shots on the quarterback. They do impact your quarterback. So that's what I'd say about that. I want to get your guys' thoughts, and then we'll jump into uh, West Virginia's run game and maybe some of what we can do in the pass game. Yeah, I mean, that's all well and fine. What Oklahoma wants to do as far as personnel goes, I think West Virginia is going to be West Virginia this game. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to establish the run game like like we have these last two games. Uh, we got our combo with the uh, with uh, CJ and White back there. Uh, we're going to see this zone run scheme uh, do its thing. I think there's some minor adjustments maybe made from – from week to week here, but I think we're going to try to establish that up front, right? Um, you know, put whatever badass you want at middle linebacker. We got a badass at center that's going to, you know, accept the challenge gladly. Um, and, you know, as far as the secondary goes, you know, we're going to, we're going to test them. We're going to test them. We're, Garrett's going to test them. He's going to test them uh, deep. He's going to test them short range. He's going to test them, in the middle and he's going to test him uh, with his feet on the ground. So, you know, I, I expect this hundred percent. This would not be a matchup if it wasn't a slug fest. Uh, and, and that's what it's going to be. Um, I just, you know, right now we're playing very good football and we just need to continue the ball rolling and, you know, we'll see what happens here on Saturday. Ooh, big O cutting a promo there, baby. I love it. I mean, let's just end like the it. episode right now. All right, be in ear, tell an ear, all these different things. Da 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 da. da. All right, see you. Take <laughs> care. Phil, Phil Steele tomorrow. Perfect. Uh, no, I missed tackles forced by by I, Garrett in the run game. I was uh I was listening to you guys. I had my AirPod in the whole time I was upstairs. By the way, just you know, because every good every every good story or side plot needs a conclusion. Uh, the, 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 bl the, the blanket fell out of the bed and that's what my daughter was crying about. So she just needed her blanket back. She was all right. All right. The blankie just blame fell her. out of the, you can't yeah, blame her. I mean, you can't man. listen, listen, blankie can't be falling out of a bed at a time like this. All right. We can't have Absolutely. that. Absolutely. So I figured that's probably what it was because I'm pretty fortunate. She, she sleeps pretty solid overnight. And usually when she does wake up, it's because she wakes up and she can't find her blanket. And so she starts fussing. So all good there in that regard. But as I was listening, I was loving what I was hearing. I love the shout outs for Nick Malone and, 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 and for Hubbard, um, this offensive line, everything you guys were talking about, this is where it starts for this team. We talked about this in the recap 
uh, episode earlier this week, you know, we we spent the entire build up to this season saying if if we want to have the type of year that we want to have, if we want this team to get where they're trying to go to, you know, to qualify for a bowl game when you still have three games left to still be in the conversation, you're on the fringes right now, but you're still in the conversation of a uh, of a Big 12 championship game. You are listen, you want to get to November and still have a chance to make the conference championship game. And you are in November right now, and you still have a chance to make the conference championship game. All these things that we talked about, how it started up front and then started with the running backs behind them. That's been a microcosm of the season. That's been the truth. And that's going to be the truth on Saturday in Norman. When we've had our best showings against Oklahoma, it 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 hasn't been the times that our quarterback has diced somebody. Although maybe with the exception of the Will Greer Kyler Murray game, right? Uh, it it hasn't it hasn't been our quarterback dicing it up through the air. It hasn't been us throwing for four hundred yards and scoring a million points when we've looked our best against Oklahoma. Uh, it has been us controlling the trenches, controlling the line of scrimmage, running the football, controlling the clock, keeping their explosive offenses that they always have on the sideline. And yeah, I mean, yes. I think. That's where it's begun for us all season, and I, I certainly think that's the case again on Saturday night. What's going to be critical? Um, here's some numbers for you. Some people have complained, well, Garrett's only completing 53, 53% of his passes. Well, there's reasons for that. Uh, again, when you're avoiding sacks and keeping the football out of harm's way and not taking chances, all those things to contribute – to the fact that he's protected the football, he hasn't turned it over a lot, and he's helping the O-line help him. He's been sacked four times in 216 dropbacks. If he's 60%, he's sacked more, okay? Now, the next step you want to get to is get to 55 to 60% within the same structure and confines of what he's trying to do. But the other thing that I'll point out, 22% of Garrett Green's throws are at least 22, 20 yards downfield. That's the highest rate in the entire Big 12. We're pushing the football vertical more than any other offense in the Big 12. So when you do that, you can't have it both ways. You can't have a bunch of quick screens dropping up your completion rate while you're also pushing the football with that kind of regularity downfield. 22% of his throws have been 20-plus yards downfield. No other Big 12 quarterback has a percentage of their throws as high that far downfield. So that's going to matter. But this is what this comes down to, guys. I talked about the TFLs and how disruptive they are, how they can impact the quarterback. They do have some sacks. But the TFLs are what butters their bread. What they're good at, they're a good third down football team. They're number three in the Big 12 in third down defense. Well, how do they win on third down? It's kind of the same narrative we talked about with West Virginia early in the season. Oklahoma wins on third down. Guess the impact that all those TFLs have? They put you off schedule. So the next thing you know, first and 10 turns into second and long, turns into third and long. 57% of Oklahoma's defensive third downs, they put you in a third and seven or longer. 57%. That sets the table for them to win on a lot of third downs. And that sets the table for them to throw a spike right in the heart of our time of possession. So winning on early downs is critical. And the way you're going to have to win on early downs is not let them be disruptive. Because Owen and I talked about it when you were away, Wes, you heard it. When they're struggling with their linebackers and sometimes their safeties with run fits, we run a lot of zone schemes. And the zone scheme can be a moving target as well from a run fit standpoint. You can't necessarily get a true beat on it and just stay true to it, head downhill, there's my gap. Right. You have to kind of read on the move, and it create, creates a cloudier presentation for the defense. So that's going to make life difficult. And we've done a good job of doing all those things as a unit, whether it's all seven of those guys playing in, whether it's the backs using proper vision, we haven't allowed a lot of tackles for loss. So if you want to track one stat and, and ask yourself what's downstream of that stat, almost everything critical is downstream of who wins on the early downs. Does West Virginia avoid the TFLs or does Oklahoma get them? If we're having a lot of second and sixes, second and sevens, turning into third and three, advantage us because also – we need to set the table. If you're going to go in as a 13-point underdog under the lights in the Palace on the Prairie, you're not going to win that game without taking chances. 
last year in Morgantown, one of the things we did, we were four or five on third, on fourth down. Four or five on fourth down. We dominated them. We'll get to that on the defensive side and transition downs, West Virginia's defense. But on the offensive side, we were four or five on third down. That's part of the reason we held the ball for 37 minutes last year. We ran for 200 plus yards because we were consistent and steady. They ran for 200 plus yards because Eric Gray was kind of just gashing us, right? Right, right? So we were four or five on fourth down last year. And two years ago in Norman, in that tight game that we felt we let slip away, we were two for two on fourth down in that one. So don't think that you're going to have Saturday night in without us trying to roll the dice a couple times on some of these critical fourth downs to maintain possession, create some extra opportunities. It's all about the TFLs. Can we shore things up, hold that dam without water leaking through? I, I want to talk about that. I mean, how do you avoid TFLs? As a running back, you've worked with great offensive lines. What do you think is the most critical part when you're facing a defense that's built on disruption like that, not letting them have what they want? Uh, I think first and foremost, I'll talk about just like technique uh, right off the bat. That first six-inch step, uh, first play side step, um, is critical because you have to be able to gain that ground. Um, you can't be stepping underneath yourself and getting off schedule, I guess, is is what uh, coaches would say. Um, and there's a point of being patient, and then there's a point of, hey, I got to go, right? So you're, you're you know, you're, you're patient to the whole quick through it, right? So you're you're making your proper read, and then once you see that daylight – pow you're out the you're out the gate which uh you know both are backs um different styles but um you know when they're on their game are really good at that right getting to the getting in the hole seeing in the daylight making the read and, and punching through and then i would say uh, you know will right will it, it, there's going to be plays where they get into the backfield um and then you know as far as a mentality of a running back get back to the line of scrimmage right we don't want to we don't want to go backwards uh in our play and get off schedule right we want to we want to be at least be able to get back to the line of scrimmage if you are hitting the backfield um and and at least make something positive out of the play um there's nothing wrong with getting hit or stuck in the backfield and and making a one yard run right uh or or just getting back to the uh to the line of scrimmage right you're still on schedule right that down didn't work but we're not negative now in the, in the yard combo but that would be the um you know unofficial expert advice from a fullback who didn't get a ton of carries uh as far as uh getting stuffed in the backfield but um you know stay on schedule, and stay and on I, schedule. I want to ask you when, let, let let me ask you about Jaheim. Jaheim had seven missed tackles forced last week, career best in his young career. He was really humming last week. Is instinct enough? He has a lack of experience. He just doesn't have enough reps to see all the angles and all the different presentations. Is instinct enough for a guy like Jaheim, whether we're running the zone scheme and he's picking his spot, whether we're running the gap scheme and he's hiding behind those big trees that are pulling, is instinct enough to keep him away from those TFLs that Oklahoma's so good at? Well, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, and I guess I didn't really explain that as far as the two running styles between CJ and White. Obviously, you can see that on on the TV copy or if you've been at the game, but he's just very shifty, right? He can make a small, minute move, right? Quick, twitch-fast muscle fibers that he's got, pow, you know what I mean, and be able to – hold that guy in position and be able to slip past him, right? Get skinny through the hole. If you've ever heard that before, get skinny, get skinny, right? When things start to close up and tighten up around you, CJ on the other hand, right? He's a guy who can take two, three, four shots, keep those legs churning. He's a big bodied back and is able to fall forward for those positive yards. Uh, and then just circling back for, with Jaheim here, Sometimes instinct is what gets you out of those TFLs, right? You're just reacting. You're not thinking. There's, you know, there there might be a premeditated thought process. Hey, if the play goes down, and you'll see that in his play once he gets more vetted out, right? More more uh, vested, more 
playing time, more reps, Thank you'll you. see that. Um, yeah, you know what I'm saying. You, you'll see the the wheels already turned before the play happened, right? I'm visualizing what's what's going to happen on this play, and if it goes sour, what are my outs? Uh, and I feel like that's where you know good players really start to become great is because those scenarios have already ran through their heads um, before pre-snap, before plays. And then that's like the instinct you're kind of talking about. You know what I mean? Uh, with him, he just has such quick reaction times uh, and is able to wiggle through all that kind of junk uh, and make things happen. Let me ask you this, though. And I've heard there's no perfect comp, right? And everybody in the age of comps, everybody wants to point to a certain player and say, he reminds me of player X. I've heard people make comps to Amos Zerway, right? But but to me with Jaheim, to me, Amos is more somewhere between, or excuse me, Jaheim somewhere between Amos and Noel. You know what I mean? I mean, I see parallels. And as a guy who played with Noel Devine, do, do you see some parallels between Noel and what you've seen out of Jaheim and his game so far? Well, the burst and the lateral movement. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, once he hit, once he's like, I'm going, he's like, yeah, I mean, he's gone. Yeah. And then I would say just like the, uh, the lateral movement, I wouldn't say he, he is quite Noel on, I mean, cause some man, sometimes Noel would almost like, he'd give a jump cut and it would be backwards. Like he'd be running full yeah. speed and be able to literally move Insane. like laterally backwards on that the field. Maryland always... that 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 Maryland tape from his freshman year he's got a couple jump cuts in that game that like they break your knees and your ankles just watch oh them. dude that's the like, old saying I want it's like trying to nail jello to a wall it's like trying to nail <laughs> yeah. jello to a wall it's yeah, incredible I mean, that Maryland game his freshman year if I just tried incredible. to do that my knees would blow out right oh. they just they I wouldn't be able to <laughs> yeah that's like the, that 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 yeah, they would his, it's just the mechanics of my body his entire tape against Maryland is just, it should just be Chris Berman just going. Whoop, 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 whoop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Well, but, and but here's sets, what I'm saying. He's, he's the skill set is there, right? Um, the skill set is there and he has all those intangibles. I was just on a podcast last night with, with Steve Slayton on his burning couch podcast. And we were talking about that. And Steve was like, man, I, you know, I want to reach, well, he's reached out and said, look, any, any piece of advice you want to pick my brain, whatever, whatever. I think that's an awesome match made in heaven because Steve has so much um, just knowledge uh, that he can just, you know, lend out whatever he, you know, be an open book. But, uh, you know, Jaheim's going to learn through multiple avenues through coach Scott, the weight room, you know, doing his work, the, the extra, I mean, he, he's going to get there. He's, he's just, you know, you don't just find a guy like him every day. And don't think guys this week, because we wanted to get to some of it last week, Neil talked about this, but then CJ got his foot stepped on. The next thing you know, we're kind of more limited. We're going to have some two back sets with both those cats on the field. And this is what's critical. This is one of the better red zone defensive football teams that we've played. And we're coming off a performance against BYU as impeccable as that seemed in so many ways. We left some points on the table in the red zone. And normally this year, we haven't done that. We've played at a very high level from a red, red zone production standpoint, punching those in, getting touchdowns at a very high level. Not so much last week. Half the time we had to settle for a field goal. Against Oklahoma, they're third in the Big 12 and holding you out of the end zone once you get in the red zone. So when the field shrinks – all those different skill sets of all those guys, whether it's CJ's power, whether it's Jaheim's shiftiness, whether it's the dual threat nature of Garrett, whether it's what the tight ends bring to the table, whether it's the O-line being able to move bodies, we're going to have to call on all those different things. And I wouldn't be surprised any point on the field, but certainly in the red zone, if we don't see some two back, some 20 personnel on with Jaheim oh, man. and CJ. I'll tell you field. right now, yeah. we're, we're wasting it not putting some 20 personnel on the as field because I'll tell you right now. Blocks. That's right. a damn dynamic backfield if I ever seen one uh, with the three of those guys back there. That's a hell of a package. And now, you know, a Rivet Max package or, or, you know, that would that'd be the formation I would think of. Hey, 
Yeah, Rip Max, hey, baby. Hey, Rip Big Max. O, be, behind you there, it looks like there's a Sports Illustrated cover that has uh, three famous Mountaineers on it. Yourself, Steve yep. Slayton, Patrick White. You know, I don't know. We starting to get we starting to get a little bit of those vibes. If if those guys uh, are running twenty personnel in the backfield, huh? Well, buddy, you know I'm gonna what? tell you right now. Um, I wouldn't go I'm ahead. nowhere you near the yes. guy that CJ is as far as a athlete. You know, what I mean, he, in my opinion. Well, I mean, yeah, but um, you got you might got a little bit more muscle than he does, old Diesel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the difference between me is I was more of a traditional guy who had you know a, you know could unhook the plow every once in a while, right? That that was my uh, that was my I superpower. You right. sneak the um, belly on them and pop for 50 in a big bowl game. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I mean, we fed those two guys so much that people just would forget about me a lot of times. And, you know, that's when I would really burn them deep. Now you got, you know, three guys back there who got a set of wheels on you. I mean, I guarantee every one of those. I know CJ runs at least a four five, not a four four. You know what I'm saying? I guarantee yeah. it's a low four five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh and then jaheem and garrett i mean they're probably battling for you know top five fastest guys on the team if not more so yeah, garrett's you know, got blistering you know, speed at this point that's what i mean and now you're putting those guys all back there at one time what way are they going you know um so Forward. it's exciting to see and they haven't done it yet so now you're now you got your little wrinkles right now you got a nice wrinkle of 20 personnel that you can put in there with 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 Carter and you know Fox, I know uh, Clements hurt right now, uh, but you got all those guys. Important. So now, when you look at the offense, you know, and you could even switch out Cole for a a, a wide. So if you want to do it. Now you got like a bigger guy up on there too. So now now it's like, oh my gosh, like it's very dynamic. What's going on on the field? You could go 21 personnel, traditional pro personnel, have Cole Taylor on the field, have Jaheim and CG on the field. All these things are possible so long as the back who's not touching the football is willing to block. What you can't yeah. do is yeah, go 20 be... personnel, and all of a sudden you're playing offense with 10 guys because somebody won't block, right? Yeah, you can't be selfish. You gotta you gotta be humble here and you gotta just you gotta be a selfless player. And you gotta, you know, sometimes you're gonna have to block, sometimes. You're going to have your number called. I mean, I think that was something that really – in even though people even knew we were mostly running to my side because, I, you know, I was the lead guy. Um, Steve was more, you know, capable of blocking if we ever had a Xerox to play um, and switch it to the other side. So, I mean, th that's where – that's where – that's where the good running back becomes great – Right. And then from great to elite, because if you want to make it to the league, you, you got you're going to have to you get you you have to know how to block. If you can't block, you're you're just a, another guy like everybody else. Oh, what was uh, was your Xerox stick signal still this? Yeah. Hand up, uh, hand down, yeah. hand up, hand down. Yeah. yeah like you're did. flipping the copy over. All right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's amazing. We, yeah. That thing that thing's been like that forever. <laughs> You know, yeah, it means same play oh, other side. Yeah, zero. I, 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 I listen. Yeah. I'm. Not, I know I'm not a genius. All right, but I was picking up what you were putting <laughs> down there on the Xerox on the other side. Yeah. Let's just. Jim Harbaugh would have had no trouble figuring that one out. All right, in Don't Michigan, Xerox they would, plays, hey, the they would Xerox that one real quick. I'll yeah. tell you what's that one real quick. I'll tell you what's crazy. Rich Rod signals were relatively easy, honestly. Yeah. Um, but you have a couple. You know you. <clears throat> usually you had like the two other running or uh, quarterbacks who were signaling as well. So it's kind of hard to pick up, but, but he called all the plays. I mean, I don't know if we ever went on a different, a different signal caller. All right. So I got to tell you guys something funny real quick, right? So Saturday we, we big group at the game at the BYU game. Owen came by the tailgate again. Now Owen and I four and O and our undefeated, you know, times together at Mountaineer field. We, 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 we discussed this all in the recap episode. It was my wife's first – Saturday night was my wife's first time at a game this year, right? I mean, think about it. She just gave birth to our second child back in May, right, at the, at the end of May. So, you know, we, we've, we've had a, a three-, four-, five-month-old throughout the course of this season, and, and she just has – you know, she'll just – she's like, I'll stay at home with the kids. She's a saint. I love her to death. 
but we did the we did you know we did a fun trip with all of our cousins and everything to the to the to the BYU romp there and we had ourselves a good time and about halfway through the first quarter there are the 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 offensive signal callers and Jed you probably know their names but the but the three guys who are offensive signal callers for WVU and they have the big banners behind them and they're all wearing different yeah. color shirts and hats and armbands and everything right and about halfway through the first quarter, my wife looks at me and she goes, what, what's going on over there? What's, what's, with those, what's with those guys on the sideline and the goofy pastel colors and the big banners behind them? And I go, babe, every team has them. I go, but you know this whole Michigan sign-stealing scandal thing we've been talking about? Yeah, you remember that? You know what I'm talking about? Right, well, now everyone's at a heightened sensitivity to it too. So you got three guys. Everything's a distraction. They're looking for one thing. One guy might be talking to the offensive line. One guy running backs, whatever. It's all deception where you're looking. You don't know where it's going. Coverage, changing things up, all that stuff. And then the second quarter rolls around and they all change their shirts. They put on different color polos and hats and everything. And she's like, well, wait a second. What's going on? They were wearing red in the first quarter and now they're wearing orange. And I'm like, babe, babe, babe. Remember, it's all about deception. It's all about deception, right? You're just trying to throw it off something different, something that the other team can't pick up on. That's going to get you through the next hour, right? That's all that it's all about. And uh, and yes, so I, I think even she could have picked up the the that this was a Xerox signal at that point. I had her Xerox well drilled. Call. I had her well drilled on Saturday night. <laughs> That's like uh, the old like freeze call. Xerox passport. Remember the old freeze call? Oh yeah, I remember the freeze call. You know I, I mean? want to tell it's you, like, I remember story the freeze behind call. freeze. That one. There's a story behind freeze. It. Uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, I wanted to attach numbers to it instead of have an actual call, but. But uh, it's it's amazing how timeless some of those things actually are, you know. But yeah, it's 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 remarkable. It really is. But buddy, that's our freeze call. I mean, no, that. that's what we well, use. Spoil, spoiler alert: it's the playoffs. Well, no. It is the playoffs. But well, here's what's crazy: the team, Work County, who we're playing, uh, our offensive coordinator coordinator actually was at that school not long ago. So they know all our signals. So, you know, hey, you know, what they might know, they might know that if man. they can't stop it us, it, it don't matter, baby. Now, Ponder State, exactly, 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 Wes, exactly. exactly. All right. Now, hold on. All right. We're really getting we're really getting <laughs> off the rails here and, and we're over an hour on this episode already. All right. So let's we let's gotta... spin let's spin this back. Yep, Jed, let's on. get let's get the final stuff here. We're we're pushing it. This is a long one already. <laughs> Um, so let's get, uh, let's get into the final nitty gritty of this, Mr. Jedger. What else we got to hit here? Well, let's talk about, uh, some of the different things that, uh, that they're going to try and do to attack us. How about that? I mean, we understand that what you're getting with Dylan Gabriel was a playmaker. Uh, this is a guy that's played for Jeff Levy, uh, really dating back to 2019 when both of them were together at Central Florida, and uh, Levy's system, he's had success just about everywhere he's been, and it was a tall ass to come in and fill the shoes of Lincoln Riley at Oklahoma, uh, especially with the attrition that program hit, but, uh, you know, when Dylan Gabriel was playing was upright last year, they were very formidable on the offensive side of the football. The hiccups that they had that we remember, the 49 nothing beat down in Red River, uh, even, you know, the, the latter portion of the TCU blowout, that was because Gabriel was hurt. But when Gabriel was playing, they were playing at a high level offensively for the better part of the season. Now, Levy's system uh, has air raid roots. There's a lot of RPO elements to it. So it's kind of the, the merger of those two worlds. Uh, but one of the intriguing things is uh, last year when we played Dylan Gabriel, when he's a, he's a legit dual threat guy. I mean, he'll tuck it and go. I mean, he had a 70-yard touchdown against Nebraska that kind of turned that game around uh, in front of the big red fans a couple years ago. I mean, he's very slippery, very explosive, deceptively explosive, I should say. So he's a true threat running the football. One of the things to consider, uh, he got hurt against TCU last year. And I'm not so sure that the rest of the year you saw him when you watched him on tape return to the same form as a runner he, he had some production on the ground against Baylor the week before they played us but I'm not so sure that he returned to 
the the Dylan Gabriel that that we knew before that, and I think that made a difference in our game. Uh, he wasn't much of a run threat against us. He was still a little reluctant, even when he would run sometimes on tape, you'd see him slide early in those earlier games. But now you got a situation, and I'm trying to figure out which way to go with this. Uh, you got a situation with Oklahoma. We talked about those last four games, Wes. In the previous three games, he'd run the football 38 times. So he was toting a mail a lot. Well, they curbed that down to four carries in Bedlam. So that was obviously a game planning thing. There was something they saw they wanted to take advantage of with the backs in the past game. So I'm not entirely certain what they want to try and do. I mean, I, I do know that they played more gap scheme recently and pulling some of those big body guys, typical Oklahoma offensive line, Kelt coached by Bill Biedenboe. You're going to have some NFL guys on it. I mean, what I've been telling these Oklahoma people in the media all week when I do these radio shows is they're asking about West Virginia's offensive line. I'm like, well, to be honest with you, it kind of looks like one of your offensive lines. I mean, what we're used to seeing. There's there's a lot of parallels there. Uh, so once again, that's what you're going to get out of Oklahoma. Uh, they're going to come downhill at you. They're going to be physical. They have weapons on the perimeter. They're always going to have playmakers. Uh, the jack of all trades that's been there I think now in his 13th year of eligibility is, is Drake Stoops. Uh, I mean, he kind of does a little bit of everything for him. Uh, they really find creative ways to get him the football. They target him way more than anybody else. Their playmaker, I guess, if you refer to it as their, their typical playmaker on the perimeter would be Jaleel Farouk. Uh, so when Oklahoma always has one or these two, one or two of these explosive guys on the perimeter uh, that's more established. Uh, he's 500 plus yards. He's a threat from anywhere on the field. They have Andrew Anthony. Uh, he's another guy, uh, nice frame on him. Very slippery, uh, good technician. Nick Anderson has been incredibly productive for them. He's their guy with size. Most of these guys are more compact, six foot, six one, but Nick Anderson's the guy with some frame to him. He's a six, four pushing 210 pounds. So he's lanky. Uh, you know, dangerous with those jump balls. But don't underestimate the physicality of Drake Stoops when it comes to contested catches. He might not have that frame, that basketball frame that, that you think of from a jump ball standpoint. And usually when you think contested catches, you think somebody who can jump out of the gym. But Drake Stoops is a physical kid. And he will just out-muscle a lot of defensive backs to come down with that football. So they've got weapons across the perimeter. They obviously have some running backs they can lean on. Uh, the Walker kid is, is more their go-to. Uh, he's tough. He's a handful in space to bring down. He's probably the more physical of the three as well. Uh, but from a size standpoint, uh, Marcus Major is 227 pounds. Uh, Walker's more compact, 5'9", 215. He just runs with that low center of gravity, will barrel around you, through you. Uh, and then Gavin Sawchuck. I mean, they once again, Oklahoma has so many different skill guys to feed the football to. They're going to present issues. They're going to present problems. Uh, but more so than anything, I think it all starts with Dylan Gabriel. Uh, if you can rattle Dylan Gabriel, he's he's not the tallest kid. He already has five batted balls this year. Uh, he had seven last year. Sometimes those batted balls, I remember before we played them, or you know, they played Baylor before we played them last year and watching that Baylor tape, Baylor picked him off three times in the first half and they were all on batted balls that became jump balls that flipped back in the secondary. So in other words, the message would be to the defensive line, hands up. If you don't get home, you can still impact the play, whether it's a quick screen, whether he's attacking the pit, whatever the case might be. So there's going to be some opportunities there. Uh, but first and foremost, he, he always set out, especially on the road. Let's try and at least marginalize their run game. He will be a part of it, I figure. Uh, but West Virginia now has held six out of nine opponents this year under their season average in rushing. That would go a long way toward helping us out, making them at least somewhat one-dimensional because we know what we're going to try and do on the offensive side of the football. But this is going to be a tempo outfit. I mean, they're going to be tempo. They're going to come at you. Uh, they're going to see something they like. They're going to force you in that to stay in that personnel group. And the next thing you know, maybe even by late in the first quarter, you're going to see defensive linemen with hands on hips running on a, a lower tank, right, Owen? So you're going to have to make the most of that. You have to be strategic with your substitutions. It's going to be a big Andrew Jackson day. When you get opportunities, get them in, get fresh bodies in there, especially those big guys with their hand in the dirt. But Interesting, interestingly enough, and I guess this is as much in the at-large or miscellaneous category as defense, but 
Oklahoma's convinced themselves that when you listen to their people, they've convinced themselves that that from an officiating standpoint, well, the Big 12 has it in for them. They're leaving, so all the calls are going against them. And I, I hope there's an ounce of truth to that, just an ounce. Because normally, ask T.J. Simmons how that goes. Oh, I right? was going to say, mean, yeah. What was WVU leaving in 2018 when they blocked, when they flagged T.J. Simmons for blocking too aggressively out of bounds? Yes. Yeah, how many I mean, times have you heard that for call 10 straight in the last years, five so. years? For 10 straight years, we've seen this. So they're, they're, it's oh, enough to say. Jed, you just we, had to. You before just had, BYU, you just, you just had to. Before didn't. BYU, one of our strengths was we were one of the more, the, the least penalized teams in the league. So we're talking about moving backwards. Well, again, you don't want to move backwards with penalties. So let's get back to what we were before that crew got a hold of us against BYU because it wasn't just us. It was also BYU, which kind of speaks to the crew, right? Uh, but I just like the fact that BYU is being penalized enough to even complain about it. I like that. I think that bodes well. If it's a conversation piece, then that's not a one game, one off, right? That they've seen enough of it to think there's something to it. So maybe there's an advantage to be found if we get back to playing the clean, efficient brand of football that we were before BYU. And maybe we can pick up an extra 20, 30, 40 yards and penalty advantage from a hidden yardage standpoint. But let's just see. But, uh, uh, again, we, we got to protect Garrett. They're going to get after him. Uh, and, and I would say this, watching Garrett be such an instrumental part of what that game was a year ago, running for 100-plus, making plays in the throw game because he was extending plays, I'm going to guess that they're going to be hell-bent on setting the edges, especially on pass downs, and not let Garrett extend the play by getting outside and breaking contain. Uh, they don't want have us having the football for 37 minutes again. So everything that went well for us last year, they're going to be trying to game planning to prevent. So we're going to have to find more creative ways to do that. And uh, there's going to be times that Garrett's going to have to find a way to beat them from the pocket. We're just going to have to do it. Now, the good news is, when you look at those 20 plus yard throws pushing the football downfield, Garrett Green's numbers are identical to Dylan Gabriel's numbers. We talked about Dylan Gabriel, what a playmaker he is. Those guys are tied for the Big 12 lead in the most completions of 20 plus yards downfield, and their numbers in that part, of that space of the field are identical. So, yeah, that's, that's what they're going to do. Uh, they have a lot of weapons, uh, they throw tempo at you. Now, depending on the flow of the game, guys. You got to wonder if you start playing keep away and it is a tight game, do they have to ease off the pedal a little more to help their defense out? If they're on the field, more snaps, I, well, we'll see. It's going to be a flow of the game issue, but these are the types of things that I'm looking at when we have such a distinct time of possession advantage going in. And that was such a deciding factor in last year's games, but I'll close with this before we, we get out to the uh, miscellaneous category turnovers. Uh, guys, they, they only suffered five through their 7-0 and start, but they've suffered six through the last two games. But, Owen, what do you see with, uh, with Oklahoma's defense? Yeah, uh, quite honestly, man, I mean, what you said was bits and pieces of what I've been kind of thinking. Um, and as far as their defense goes, I, honestly, man, I, I'm, I'm what I said as advertised earlier. Hey. We're going to be who we are. Just make sure you show up on Saturday. What about their offense? I meant to flip that question. What about their offense? Buddy. Buddy. Lee. Cutter. D-line. Secondary. Let's go, boys. It's game time. This is <laughs> this is where the, the boys become men. All right? This game right here. Okay, it's time sure. to be physical. You're going to wake up a little sore after this one. Okay, it's Jed, time to be physical. It's time to you know what time to take said, control. Gabe and Teddy said about Lee Koba, he was on their all get off the bus first team. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Lee Koba. <laughs> and if you've ever been up close and personal with Lee, oh, yeah. Lee absolutely looks the part. I mean, he he looks scary. Jed, I completely agree with you oh, on that. Let yeah, let him get off the bus first. Um, the before you go to your miscellaneous category, and again, I want to keep this this quick because we are rambling on on this episode. Not but much left. Um, this Sooners this Sooners offense strikes me weird in the sense of 
I mean, every year that we've played them, that we've been in the Big Twelve, right? It's it's been the it's been the Bakers and the Kylers and the Hurts. It's it's been the D.D. Westbrooks and the Marquise Browns and the talented wide receivers. It's been the the P. Rines and the Joe Mixons and the and the talented running backs as well too. I I don't see that from them now. I don't look at their offense and see, oh yeah, there's two first round picks there, and there's a couple. There's no Creed Humphrey. There's no, I mean, you know, like there's no Trent Williams. Uh, and I know he was a uh, he was a little before our time, but um, you know, or I guess wait, did we see Trent Williams that first year in 2012? Anyways, doesn't matter. That's a that's a complete that's a that's a completely side think. conversation. Good question. Um, but I. I just don't see the do the good like good players without a doubt in a good offensive unit. That's not what I'm saying, but it's like every year coming into this matchup, Oklahoma has had somebody under center in the backfield, spread out Mark wide Andrews. on the Mark Andrews. Thank you. I mean, like all over, all over the place, they've had him. I I, I don't know if I see there, there's nobody that has me going. Oh my god, that guy's gonna kill us like I normally do every year when we're getting ready to play the Sooners. Green Austin Stogner, great example. South Carolina transfer. Uh, you know, even even when you look at what they present from a skill position standpoint offensively, that they do have great players. But I don't know if I I would would say any of those players remind me of any of those types of names that you were just talking about. Take Austin Stogner at tight end. I remember I used to have nightmares watching tape on Mark Andrews. He He's was a, a matchup freak. nightmare. A now, freak. Austin Stogner can't hurt you, no doubt about it. But I, I viewed Mark Andrews as just this beast that was going to hurt you, if, even if you did everything right. Uh, but not necessarily the case. These guys can hurt you. They will hurt you at times through the game. You have to rebound and bounce back. But the, the I guess the, the place that they're most similar to what they were to those previous offenses under Lincoln Riley is up front. Bill Biedenboe is still recruited at an incredibly high level. Uh, I think their recruiting classes have been driven by that. They have back-to-back top 10 recruiting classes. As a matter of fact, he, he just named the highest class in the history of the school, okay, uh, did Venables. They have two of the top 10 portal classes the last two years. That's how they've addressed these shortcomings on the defensive side so quickly. But it, it's sprinkled throughout their roster, just like it is every roster in America today, a bunch of transfers. But I, I think their offensive line is still somewhat at the level that it was then. Maybe not quite, but closer than the skill guys. You're right. Makes T- sense. Take, for instance, uh, Dylan Gabriel. I think Dylan Gabriel was an exceptional player. Dylan Gabriel will be a kid who gets a camp invite, but I don't think he's going to have uh, a lengthy NFL career like a Baker Mayfield. No. So, uh, or some of these backs that you talked about. I mean, the you know, Joe Mixon, Samaj P. Ryan. I mean, these guys, they, they grew on trees for five, six, eight years out there when they were really humming offensively. Uh, now they're among the best in the league right now, but uh, th- that's just it. Uh, CD Lamb was CD Lamb. There's another one we haven't mentioned. CD <laughs> Lamb had a different skill set than Drake Stoops. Yeah. Drake Stoops a different type of player. He's a blue collar grinder that will hurt you because he's a blue collar grinder, right? He's just his measurables aren't going to scare you the way CD Lamb's did. Exactly. So there's something to be said for that. Yeah, I, I agree with that point. So that was that, that was just all that I had on their offense. Like I said, I know they're still dangerous. They've still been scoring points in bunches. I mean, their last handful of games, 24, 33, 31, 34, 50. I mean, they're they're still scoring points. Um, but that was just that was just something that that I wanted to bring to the forefront. All right. Uh, real quick before we give final thoughts and send offs, uh, miscellaneous here. Last thoughts, Jed. The only thing I was going to say is they're incredibly difficult at home. They're a different team at home than they are on the road. Uh, it's almost like we're getting the business end this week of what we enjoyed as an advantage last week. BYU struggled on the road. They were really good at home. Well, this week we're, we're, we're heading to the Palace. We're going to take Oklahoma's best shot. We got them under the lights. We're 13-point dogs. We talked about it all earlier. Well, so we have to do whatever we need to to neutralize that advantage, to mitigate that advantage, much like we did for three and a half quarters two years ago, the last time we were out there. Except this time, let's finish the job. We are a much better football team than we were two years ago, the last time we headed Norman, Oklahoma. Oklahoma might be as good. 
I'm not convinced they're a better football team than they were two years ago. We're better. So you can attach all the 13 point spread you want to. I mean, yes, they could drop a dime and beat anybody by four touchdowns if they show up and play their best football, especially with that crowd behind. No doubt about it. But I'm just having a hard time talking myself into all that when I understand we're still playing with a pissed off edge. We're still 14th until proven otherwise. We're 13 point underdogs. We're six and three against the third hardest schedule in college football. And we're still 13 point underdogs against a team that's dropped two straight. There's a lot to sell to this football team. And I don't think it'll be a hard sell this week, Owen, to get them ticked off, to get them fired up. This environment will fire them up more than anything. But we're built to run the football. Run games tend to travel well. So if we can go on the road and this O-line plays like it can, that is our best way to neutralize the miscellaneous, miscellaneous advantage of, uh, of their home field and, uh, and get in there and finish this way thing the way we need to finish it and get the signature win against a ranked double-digit favorite Oklahoma team. I mean, what I want to hear next week, I want to hear next week everybody say, well, they weren't that good. They're not even ranked. That's what I want to hear. Yep, same here. Because we knocked them out of the ranked, you know, the top 25. I want to hear people say, well, they weren't even that. It's overrated. They're they're not even ranked. I want to hear that next week because we knocked them out of it. I completely agree. I am with you 100% on that, Jed, and I think that's a great way to to wrap this thing up. Better show up. Let's go get it done. We've owed them. We've owed them a victory out in their place. Let's go slay that final dragon before they bounce to get their butts kicked out in the SEC. Uh, as we wrap this up, Owen, one more time, Saturday, you'll be Buffalo Wild Wings in Charleston. Uh, you got a Sugar Bowl Foundation event. Plug it, brother. Yep. Uh, 6 p.m. Game starts at 7. Be there. Be square. Buffalo Wild Wings and uh, Crosslands there. And uh, great opportunity to uh, support the youth. Um, it's it's for Christmas for those kids, special kids. Uh, and uh, definitely come out if you can. And uh, it's going to be a good time. And we're going to watch, watch uh, the Mountaineers beat the cheeks off uh, Sooners. You're darn right we are. You're darn right we are. I Jed was talking about some of that call stuff and somehow Oklahoma's complaining now and, oh, the Big 12 has it out to get us. I Here's the best example I could come up with, guys, to get us out of here. The Boston Red Sox aren't quite the New York Yankees, right? And they and they and they know that and they use that to their advantage. Like the Red oh, Sox, <laughs> the Red Sox kind of continually play that underdog and we're not as bad as the Yankees and we're one of you guys just out fighting the good fight, kind of like Oklahoma does with Texas. But it's a bunch of BS. Yes, the Red Sox are not the Yankees, but they're a half step below the Yankees of being just as insufferable as they are, much like Texas and Oklahoma. Yes, Oklahoma is not Texas, but they are a half step down the ladder of being just as insufferable as Texas. But they've actually been really good the last decade plus, unlike the Longhorns, which almost almost makes them more insufferable. We finally got that monkey off our back last year. Let's go out with two straight wins against these douche nozzles. All right. And get one in their place as well, too three losses in a row, send them off to life in the SEC where they're not going to be nearly as relevant as they've been in the Big 12, which, to be fair, they have have had their way in this conference without a doubt. But that time has come to an end, and we stamp it. We cement it Saturday night down in the prairie. And a lot of that stuff, what, what Jed was talking about, that fat, sassy, spoiled Sooner fan base, Uh, They wake up even more pissed off on Sunday and are questioning everything they think they know about their program. I can't wait to hear what Phil Steele says about this 13-point spread. I really can't. Well, Phil, if you're listening now, brother, come on. Keep the good mojo rolling because we're feeling good all of a sudden. That'll do it for us on this edition of ITG, but still to come tomorrow is Phil Steele Friday, so make sure you're keeping it locked. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts on YouTube all of our social media channels. You can find our weekly ITG Pick'em in the YouTube description and on our Twitter account at In The Gun Podcast. And, of course, the one thing we ask of you, as always, is to be an ear and tell an ear about your new favorite WVU football podcast. A big thanks, as always, to our producer slash co-host slash extraordinaire, Skylar Callahan, for putting this together. For Jed Drenning and Owen Schmidt, 
I am Wesley Euler. Take care, everybody. Let's beat the hell out of Oklahoma. You've been in the gun.